Welcome to Billy's Books. Today we're going to do the brand new biography of George Harrison, The Reluctant Beetle. Hey, welcome to Billy's Books. Today we're going to do the new biography of George Harrison, The Reluctant Beetle. As you know, I love the Beatles. And I love George. Um, George of the four Beatles is the most paradoxical, the most cosmic, the also most down-to-earth, the nicest and the meanest, and so forth. Uh, anyway, so um, you get the feeling that all four of them were middle, uh, were working-class guys, but really John was middle-class, but he, for the image, uh, um, when they got famous, sort of pulled, pulled his accent, he made it more working-class, uh, both to appeal to the Beatles' image and also to his own political tendencies. Um, George uh, and they all were grew up in in mid in mid century um, England, so they were all kind of you know corporal punishment was kind of a thing. I'm going to read you my first quote right off the bat from George's George's childhood. As at most British boys' schools in that era, corporal punishment was a normal and recurrent part of everyday life. Here, up to six strokes of a cane or wooden ruler on the wrongdoer's outstretched palm. One day, when a teacher man named Mr. Lyons was administering it to George, the ruler accidentally whacked down on the tender underside of his wrist instead, causing him extreme agony and leaving a nasty contusion. Nine-year-olds, then, were supposed to take their punishments without complaint, so at first George tried to hide his swollen wrist from his father, but inevitably Harold noticed it and demanded an explanation. Most fathers would have let the incident pass, saying the same thing had happened to them at school and never done them any harm. But not this one. Next morning, while we were in class, there was a tap on the window, Ian Taylor recalls. I assume Ian Taylor is one of his schoolmates. It was Mr. Harrison. He called the teacher out and smacked him one. Knocked him over, in fact. So, uh, one of the things they mention is that um, the different uh, houses um, raised their children differently. Um, Paul was um, in a very supportive household, and George was in a very ho supportive household, too. John, as you probably know, his house was a little more broken. Um, and Ringo was in the hospital a lot as a kid. Um, what's interesting is they talk about in this book also that George was prone to being sick a lot, um, actually more so than Ringo, and I didn't really realize that. So for one, one example is when they did the Ed Sullivan show, when they first crossed the Atlantic, um, it's known that George was, had, there was a stand-in for George during the rehearsal for the Ed Sullivan show, and then when they actually did the show, he stepped out and did his show enthusiastically. And they were saying, oh, he's got the flu. In fact, he had strep that night and had a 104 fever. So, way, way to do that. Um, the kids, uh, while they were, before they were famous in, um, Liverpool, they all got. They all wanted cool guitars. They couldn't get any Fenders or anything badass like that because apparently American guitars were banned at the time in the UK. So all the so all British rockers had to get. Most of them got Hofners from Germany, and Paul got a very famous Hofner bass, as you know. But also John and George had Hofner electric guitars. That by the time they got famous, they replaced with cooler guitars. But they had those originally. Um, George was a particularly bad student in school because he didn't like the rigor and all that. Um, and also, he uh, could have gotten guitar lessons, but he didn't get much from them. So most of what he learned, he learned from himself, picking it, picking out of the uh, off the records just over and over again until he got it. He's known for being a very hard worker when he was young and really just practicing and practicing to catch up. And it paid off because by the time he got around to Paul and John, or at least John, he had really, he had more chops than either of them. So they were like, okay. Um, yeah, in fact, Paul brought George to the quarryman, and John, who was a couple years older, you know, he said, who's that bloody kid who's hanging around all the time? And George d did not impress John for a long, long time. Some would say ever. Um, uh, and he always saw, thought him as a lesser person. And George, this whole book talks about George's sense of being, in, you know, a lesser beetle. Um, and that, that, of course, you know, he smoldered over the years and such. Um, 
there is famously a story of George um, being um, meeting John or John coming to George at a party in 1974 while George is on tour and John volunteers uh, offers to appear with him at the Madison Square Garden and instead of George going ooh that sounds like a great idea he just sort of grabs John by the by the scruff of his by the collar and says where were you when I needed you and John is totally freaked out and like ah, 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 and stuff like that and doesn't even know what to do and they continue arguing and then and then George says something to the effect of you know take your glasses off I want to I want to really look you in the eyes so take John takes off his sunglasses and puts on his regular specs and George is like no no glasses and grabs them off and throws them on the ground which of course really freaks John even further and the witnesses, and May Pang tells this story, um, the witnesses were all horrified. And of course, the next day, you know, George came to John and was like, I'm really sorry, I was stressed out. And they, they made up immediately like brothers do. Um, it's probably good to know that George was um, doing a lot of coke on that tour. So that may have something to do with his intensity at that night. Anyway, I've deviated from my plans. Um... Uh, George, uh, um, because he was a bad student, ended up, you know, not going to any of the cool schools. So he ended up being an, electri an electrician's apprentice before he got famous. And he didn't really like that either. And apparently he was working in a department store during Christmas time when they had a, you know, the Santa was, the kids were all sitting on the Santa's lap. And he, he, he did something with a fuse and brought down the lights to the whole <laughs> department store. So... <laughs> He had the magic touch, and that's, that's, I think that's funny. When they went to Hamburg um, to, uh, you know, to, when the legendary when they really learned how to be professionals and played eight-hour nights and stuff like that and were popping pills the whole time, um, they had, they had very famously had a guy who told them, Mach show, Mach show, which is, you know, German, uh, a German guy who's basically saying, make, make a good show, make a good show, show it. But in Liverpool... Uh, to make show of someone is to mock them. And so John, of course, took that opportunity to mock the Germans. He would do, you know, this sort of thing. And he apparently he would drop his trousers and, you know, moon them to their delight. He didn't realize, they didn't realize or care that he was mocking them and, you know, calling them Nazis and stuff. They just loved it because they were, they were so entertaining. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was insulting them left and right. I think that's funny. Um... When they came back to uh, what they went to Hamburg several times. One of the times when they returned, they they started playing at the Cavern, and um, but initially they were only given a day shift, um, the the lunch shift, and they were told you gotta bring in people. That's that's your job to bring people into lunch, which of course they took upon themselves to do quite well. But Paul actually had a real job, a day job, and he had a conflict. Uh, with working in the daytime, which is about, in fact why the Beatles got that day gig because most of the working bands in Liverpool already had a day job, and but the Beatles didn't except for Paul. Paul's dad wanted him to, you know, keep his job, and so John said, "Your dad or me," and obviously Paul chose John over his dad as far as career goes. Um, back in Hamburg, uh, Stu Sutcliffe, their uh, first base player, um, a guy from one of John's really tight buddies from the art school who fell in love with a German woman, Astrid Kirschner. Um, Stu died. He had been, after a gig, kicked in the head um, by some ruffians, and uh, he had lots of pain after that, but didn't do anything, of course, because he was a young man. And eventually he croaked, um, and it was all very sad. And John and George went back. At, or There's a photo of John and George. I don't know if the rest of the Beatles went, but... Um, there's a photo of John and George with John, who was really close to Stu, sitting in a chair, and George next to him. And Astrid sees it as him being, George being very protective of John. Astrid says that he was, John was on the verge of tears, and George was there to sort of hold him up. What's strange about this book, I found, was that, you know, they go into great detail about all their stuff, but they really kind of skip from early 62 to 1963. I don't know if nothing interesting happened that year, that's hard to believe. This guy, Philip Norman, has written, they have reviews on the back for his John Lennon, The Life, Paul McCartney, The Biography, and a Beatles. So this guy's written uh, a Beatles biography, and then this is new one is the third biography of the individual Beatles. So you'd think he'd know quite a bit about Paul McCartney, and yet in places, 
I guess maybe this is a POV thing since it's about George. He sort of doesn't know certain things about Paul McCartney that you would expect him to know. Um, the big, cons you know, they sort of talk like Paul's just this sort of shallow guy the whole time. Um, but the thing that really struck me was not knowing that he talks about when they were working on Revolver, um, that, uh, you know, um, when it was time to do Tomorrow Never Knows for John's song, John Holly's Crazy Ideas, and it was, and then the book says, George Martin came up with tape loops to uh, add underneath it. And it's like, no, no, actually those tape loops were all Paul. Paul put a lot of time into generating those tape loops and he brought them to the studio uh, to make it work. So that's a strange oversight that he doesn't mention that. I don't know if it's be, it's part of the George-ish anti-Paulishness to the book or he actually didn't know that. I mean, that's hard to believe. That's like standard Beatles stuff. If you're, if you're a Beatle fan, you know that Paul brought those tape loops in for Tomorrow Never Knows. During the Summer of Love, George and some other people went to San Francisco and he famously walked through and everyone was like, oh my god, that's so cool that George is with us. And even though all the pictures show them having a blast, surprisingly, he later talks about how miserable it was and how everyone, you know, he, they were just, he, he thought it would be this life of enchantment, but it's just a bunch of, you know, screwed up kids. Um, but more things happened after they went to San Francisco, so I'm just going to read out, read some of that, these chapters here, the paragraphs here. To round off the disillusioning trip, on the return flight to L.A., the Learjet suddenly went into a stall. George, seated behind the pilot, saw its whole control, bo control board light up with the word UNSAFE before the hor horrific plunge was corrected. <laughs> Monterey, in the aftermath of the festival, also lacked enchantment. Derek Taylor, he's, well, another, he's an Apple guy, part of their contingent. Derek Taylor was to recall that in a coffee shop where they'd stopped to eat, the waitress didn't recognize George and made a great show of clearing tables to avoid serving the cloud of denim in the corner. Finally, George told her, We've got the money, you know, and waved about $1,000 in bills under her nose. She recognized him then and dropped every piece of crockery she was holding. I like how he was holding out. Because he's, you know, they, they, what they say in the pages before is that the Beatles weren't used to paying for stuff. So when it, wherever they'd go somewhere, they'd be like, Oh, the Beatles, yes, you will, you eat for free, you eat for free. But it didn't happen here. So she's, he's like, okay, finally, I guess I have to admit that I have thousands of dollars in my pocket. <laughs> he is known for being a little chintzy, so that's funny. They went to Rishikesh and they studied with the, um, the Maharishi. And initially, they were all, the Beatles were finally happy again. And they were all like brothers and you know, they're relatively clean living. They uh, had a good time and it was nice to go back that way. Um, another story is 1968, um, probably on that same trip, I'm not sure about that though. Uh, George had just talked to some people real casually, and, um, and like, oh yeah, you're in London, come by, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a few months passed, and then when George was not in London, <laughs> a whole bunch of Hell's Angels appeared at the new Apple building that they had set up, and said, George Harrison told us we can crash here for a while. And they being Hell's Angels, uh, everybody was really scared and was like, uh, and they were like, oh, and by the way, we, you know, the, the, the Hell's Angels trip was to go from, um, from America to uh, Czechoslovakia, where Russia had just um, invaded. And their intent was to go and let the, let the Russians know what was what. Now I don't know what happened when they got to check it when or if they got to Czechoslovakia, but what, but they did a pit stop in London, and they were like, oh, and by the way, we took all our motorcycles on a boat, and we want since George invited us here, y'all should pay for that. I don't know if they did or not, um, but that was part of it. And so then they stayed, and they they had they had their sleeping bags all set up in one of the Apple's, Apple rooms, and they just had and just sort of took over the building for a while, and everyone was scared to say anything. Because um, they were the Hell's Angels, and George even sent a note. Oh, please be nice to them. They could kill you. <laughs> but he still didn't come back. They had a, um, another story in the book is really entertaining. I think is a rat. I guess it was Christmas. Um, they had a big Christmas dinner, uh, and some of the Beatles were there. John and Yoko were at the head table. And when the turkey came out, the turkey came from the kitchen, and they and on a cart, and they took the cart towards the head table where John and Yoko were. And on the way across the room, all the Hell's Angels raided the cart. So by the time the cart got to the table, it was just skin and bones. 
Everyone was too scared to protest except the new Musical Express journalist Alan Smith, whose wife, Mavis, worked in Derek Taylor's press office. A single blow from Frisco Pete knocked Smith into the laps of Father and Mother Christmas, leaving tea from the cup in John's hand dripping from his spectacles. Only George could rid Apple of these perilous guests, which he finally did with a finesse that astonished Aspinall. They were talking, and George said, There's ying and there's yang, there's in, there's out, there's up, there's down, you're here, you go. So the angels just went, okay, and left. That's one of my favorite stories from this book. So here's a quote from page 239. All too easily, inner peace could be replaced by outer scratchiness. Derek Taylor was to recall sitting next to him on a transatlantic flight as he was chanting in an undertone, and a cap cabin attendant asked him if he was, if he wanted anything. Fuck off, George Snap said. Can't you see I'm meditating? So that is one of the paradoxical things. He, uh, earlier on, actually, his uh, Paul, Patty Harrison, his wife at the time, says that he tried to be more cosmic, but the more he tried to meditate, the more the less happy he became, which defeated the whole purpose of creating lightness. You know, you would think that it would be watching George and Paul bicker all the time. You'd think that they would eventually have a fight. But there, this mentions here with no details, unfortunately, that George Martin is the only one to have witnessed um, John and George had an actual physical fist fight. Paul was right about Alan Klein, and he was ostracized for it by the other three who were all seduced by his BS. Um, uh, he, one of the, one of the many things that, uh, Alan Klein stepped in because the Beatles were having money troubles and he had an expression FYM, which meant fuck you money. And that the idea was that when he was once, once he was in control, they wouldn't have to worry about money anymore because he'd have it so under control. Uh, meanwhile, of course he was rip, uh, robbing them blind. Uh, wonderful. Paul was right. There was a cop in, um, London, who famously tried to uh, book uh, to um, catch uh, rock stars with drugs, and he often his team would often plant stuff, and so it was really he was later discredited and um, you know shamed. But at this time, he had already gotten Mick Jagger, and I think maybe Keith Richards, and raided John, and he next his next his next victim was um, George Harrison. Um, and he, his team went to George Harrison's house, and George wasn't there, but Patty was, and they found they plant, found or planted some stuff. It's not like he didn't have any, but the, but the book says they found stuff in his shoe, which of course means they planted it because he that wasn't what, that wasn't his hiding place. <laughs> so you know it's a plant. They probably didn't find the real stuff, but their plant was enough. Um, but then when George and a few other people from Apple eventually showed up. They found that uh, the cops were still waiting for him, and um, but they uh, they were drinking tea, but it wasn't Patty that made them tea. It was somebody from their own team, because Patty refused to make them tea, and I I just love that she refused to make them tea. <laughs> and there's many more stories. You'll have to read it yourself, but only if you care about George Harrison. If you're someone that hates the Beatles or hates George Harrison, don't read this book. Why would you? You're out there, and you're probably not even watching this review, so never mind you. Of those of us who are watching this, do like him, and you should read it. It's entertaining. If you can't do, review. Fuck y'all.